This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Africa News Tonight from the English to Africa service of The Voice of America, your source for Pan-African news and world developments. I'm Yehayas Wuhib in Washington. Coming up on African News Tonight... He said gunmen on motorcycles attacked the mosque in Funtua about six hours north of Abuja Saturday night as people were praying, shooting the imam and one other person. That's Timothy Obiezu reporting on the kidnapping of four shippers in a Nigeria mosque. Details coming up also. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa vows to fight to stay in office after a report alleges he violated the law. And a look at next week's U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit. We'll have these stories and more on African News tonight. But first, our top story. In South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa has decided to fight to remain in office after a report implicated him in possible crime and suggested he may have violated the Constitution. The leadership of his African National Congress party has been meeting today to debate the allegations. The party is split in its support for the president. Darren Taylor has more. Cyril Ramaphosa's alleged offenses include tax evasion, holding foreign currency illegally and covering up a crime, all relating to the theft of at least $580,000 from his game farm in early 2020. The president's conduct with regard to the burglary has split South Africa between those who want him to stay and those who say he must go. Ramaphosa says the stolen money was from the sale of buffalo to a Sudanese businessman who can't be traced. The president says his farm manager hid the money in a sofa after the sale was made in December 2019. In February 2020, burglars stole the cash. An investigating panel says for reasons that remain unclear, the president did not report the crime to the police. Instead, according to an affidavit from a former intelligence chief, the ANC leader allegedly sent personal bodyguards to reclaim the cash from a gang hiding in neighboring Namibia. Ramaphosa denies these allegations, but hasn't explained why an official police docket about the robbery wasn't given to the panel. He's asking the Constitutional Court to nullify the panel's findings. I think that that's the appropriate course of action. There are credible, credible questions raised around the quality of the report itself and that it is potentially reviewable. Professor Alex van den Jeffer is an expert in governance at Wits University. It's important not to jump the gun in terms of a process because of the stakes. The greatest concern that many people have is the succession. When we see the markets crash, it's because the fear of who might take over. What would stop in terms of policy if the president had to stand down? What would take over as policy in relation to governance? Van den Jeffer says Ramaphosa's alleged crimes, as serious as they are, pale in comparison to the corruption that allegedly happened under his predecessor, Jacob Zuma. Van den Jeffer says Ramaphosa has strengthened the powers of anti-corruption agencies to investigate criminals in the highest echelons of the ANC. If we have a continuation of the current strategy of making the NPA, the Hawks, etc. independent, and able to prosecute people, some of the people there are going to jail. (laughs) And therefore they want to fight this as hard as possible because it's really under the Ramaphosa government that they are under threat. The ANC's top officials are meeting in Johannesburg today to decide what to do given the panel's findings against their leader. Political consultant Sam Mkokeli says no matter what happens, Ramaphosa's reputation is deeply scarred ahead of elections in 2024. His affidavit with an official statement and an oath is so dodgy. And that problem is not going to go away. It's not a question of that there's nobody else. It's a question of can this horse run the race? Members of Parliament will debate the report tomorrow, then vote on whether to launch an impeachment process to probe the president's conduct and possibly remove him from office. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. 
Sudan's military and civilian political leaders have signed an agreement that will lead to a transition to civilian rule. The French press agency says the deal was signed by paramilitary commander Mohamed Hamdan Dagola and several civilian groups. They include the Forces for Freedom and Change Coalition, which was ousted in last year's coup, and the Islamist Popular Congress Party, a faction of the Democratic Unionist Party. Reuters News says under the accord, the military would be represented in a transitional government only on a security and defense council headed by a prime minister. The French news agency AFP says negotiations are continuing on issues such as military reforms, financial accountability, and transitional justice. The talks leading to the agreement were facilitated by the United Nations, the United States, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. Nigerian police in northwest Katsina State say they have rescued four people abducted by gunmen from a mosque Saturday and are searching for at least 13 more still missing. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja, Nigeria. Katsina State Police spokesman Gambo Isa on Monday said the worshippers still missing from the attack on the mosque are mostly adult men. He said gunmen on motorcycles attacked the mosque in Funtua about six hours north of Abuja Saturday night as people were praying, shooting the imam and one other person. Speaking to VOA by phone, Isa says the two survived and are being treated at a local hospital. On that day... Uh, worshippers were observing the last prayers of the night. Uh, police, uh, before the arrival of our police team, the hoodlums have already escaped uh, with some other uh, worshippers. But a combined effort of uh, police uh, vigilantly successfully um, uh, went after the, the terrorists and uh, about four of the victims were rescued. Right now, we are, uh, we are looking for about uh, 13 uh, worshippers. Local media reported more than 40 people were missing. The mosque attack is the latest in a wave of abduction for ransom violence in northern Nigeria that authorities have struggled to stop. The attacks have increased pressure on President Muhammad Buhari's government to improve security ahead of February elections to choose his successor. Nigeria's national police deployed heavy security to the reopening on Monday of the Abuja-Kaduna rail line. Train service was suspended after gunmen attacked the night of March 28, killing nine passengers and abducting 62 others. Negotiations saw the passengers slowly released in groups with the latest captives freed in October. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. In Chad, a court has handed jail terms of up to three years to 262 people arrested in deadly protests in October. According to the French press agency AFP, 401 people were included in a four-day trial that ended Friday at the high-security Koro Toro prison, about 600 kilometers from Injamina. The state prosecutor says 80 of them were given suspended sentences and 59 have been released. AFP says the defendants were charged with taking part in an unauthorized gathering, destroying belongings, arson, and disturbing public order. Forty civilians and ten members of the security forces died on October 20 when police fired on protesters in the capital and in other cities. The demonstrations were held to mark the date, the date uh, when Chad's military had promised to return power to civilians. General Mohammad Idris Debi said the protesters were trying to stage a coup. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. I'm Yeheyes Wuhib in Washington. Please note, we have moved our programs from voanews.com to voaafrica.com. There you'll find all your favorite VOA radio and TV programs and a whole lot more. Find us on voaafrica.com. Next week, dozens of leaders from African nations will be in Washington for the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit. 
A few days ago, my colleague Vincent McCory sat down with Dana Banks, special assistant to the president and chair of the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit. They discussed the goals of the summit and the major issues facing the United States' relationships with African governments. In this excerpt from their conversation, Banks starts by talking about the format of the summit. The summit will be held over the course of three days uh, in upcoming weeks uh, from December uh, 13th through the 15th. Um, it's President Biden's chance to, uh, to welcome and engage broadly with the continent uh, and discuss issues of shared um, priorities as well as re- lifting up opportunities that are, um, that are bound in our partnership with the continent. So. Uh, Over the course of those three days, there will be various sessions, official sessions and fora, uh, and the third day will be the actual Leaders' Day, uh, where the the heads of state and heads of delegation will have a chance to exchange with the president, with the vice president, with members of the cabinet on some of these key issues, uh, including uh, food security, as well as strengthening our uh, cooperation in the multilateral arena. Uh, and really that day will start off with uh, the most important uh, sort of, uh, uh, I think, uh, framing about our relationship is how the continent has put forward their aspirations and their goals under the Agenda 2063 document, the Africa we want, uh, and how we as the United States uh, can help meet our partners to achieve those goals while working on both regional and global uh, challenges and lifting up opportunities. Mm. Now, Africa is a huge continent. How did you go about choosing which leaders to invite Mm -hmm. and who will be there up to this point? Who can we confirm? Well, I'm pleased to report that as of today, um, we have uh, confirmation from all 50 of the invitations that President Biden uh, extended. That's 49 uh, uh, countries and uh, the chairman of the African Union, Musa Faki. Uh, so in developing the rubric for the invitations, which really follows in line uh, to a great extent from uh, what we've done in what was done in 2014, uh, but we really, you know, took the lead of, of our African partners in the African Union, and we've invited uh, countries, or invitations were extended to countries, uh, who were in good standing with the African Union. So currently, you know, there are four countries who have been suspended by the AU. They were not extended invitations, uh, and uh, two countries, one of which uh, we do not recognize as the United States, and then a one with whom we do not share full uh, diplomatic relations. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, and that really falls in line with what we've done in 2014. Yes. And that leads to actually a question when it comes to, you know, some of those who have not been invited, mm-hmm. but still many Africans will be looking at those coming to the United States and saying, well, uh, some of these countries mm-hmm. have a record, a very poor record of human rights. Mm-hmm. Uh, how have you ensured that that doesn't become an, kind of a, a dark side to these invitations? Look, I think we, you know, need to just acknowledge that um, as partners, we're not always going to agree on things. We're not always going to uh, uh, support uh, some of the actions that our, our partners take. But it is important in these relationships to discuss them, to meet, to talk about them face-to-face. And that's what this summit is the opportunity to do, um, to talk about those challenges while also acknowledging that Africa as a continent, our African partners from around the continent um, are integral to uh, addressing some of these defining challenges of our era, whether it's on climate change, health security, uh, food security, infrastructure. Uh, all of these um, really uh, global challenges are inherent and need the partnership of, of, our, of our African partners on the continent. So mm-hmm. that, that is the goal of uh, of the summit to be able to talk about things that we don't necessarily agree on, but also how we can cooperate in areas that we do. Mm-hmm. Well, that was Dana Banks, the U.S. Chair for the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. She was speaking with Africa 54 Managing Editor Vincent McCory. We'll have more of their discussion tomorrow. For more on the summit, please take a look at voaafrica.com and stay tuned to all your favorite VOA programs for coverage. 
Next year, Zimbabwe hosts the biggest annual conference in Africa on AIDS and STIS organized by the Society for AIDS in Africa. The event rotates to different countries each year, and it last was in Zimbabwe in 2015. From Harare, reporter Kuzaza Nawashi has the details. Zimbabwe President Emerson Nangagwa welcomed the return of the conference on AIDS and sexually transmitted infections. It is my singular honor and privilege to be addressing you at this signing ceremony of the International Conference on AIDS and STIs in Africa, ICASA 2023, Memorandum of Understanding. Zimbabwe is indeed honored to host the 2023 International Conference on AIDS and STIs in Africa. This opportunity dovetails with the Second Republic's engagement and re-engagement policy. It equally echoes our commitment to realize Sustainable Development Goal 3 for health lives and the promotion of the well-being of all ages towards universal health coverage. The President made the comment at a signing ceremony for the event in October. The Society for AIDS in Africa organizes the International Conference on AIDS and STIs in Africa. Michael Guasira is the editor and founder of Health Times, an online publication covering health issues in Zimbabwe. On the health side, it also gives us an advantage as Zimbabwe to interact with other countries and also, you know, just get to learn how other set other countries are progressing in as far as HIV and AIDS and STIs is concerned here in Africa. And also the fact that this is going to be an African event. A number of African countries failed to attend the International AIDS Conference in Canada due to visa issues. This is an opportunity for us as Africans to converge as Africans because we share the same problems with in, in as far as HIV and AIDS is concerned, that there won't be any visa hiccups. God knows Homwe is a marketing consultant specializing in tourism. He says the industry is likely to benefit from massive bookings for the event, including companies that handle what he referred to as mice. It's a huge plus for the tourism sector. Uh, hosting such a magnitude of an event, it's a boost, especially for the mice, uh, which is meetings, incentive conferences and events, which is one of the tourism packages Zimbabwe is offering in terms of uh, growing the sector. Looking back at hosting the previous ICASA, which also impacted, especially on the hospitality industries, the hotels, lodges and uh, Airbnbs, which were f- full to capacity. It's also an impact to the aviation sector and to the airports as well, to the travel industry. In the 2015 conference in Zimbabwe, the conference brought a number of participants, which was a welcome boost for the economy. In 2023, over 10,000 people are expected to attend. Zimbabwe faces soaring inflation and shortages of food, fuel and medicines. Despite the challenges, over the years, it has done better than most countries in its fight against HIV and AIDS. Recently, it surpassed the United Nations AIDS 95-95-95 goal to have 95% of all people living with HIV to know their status, 95% of patients receiving antiretroviral drugs or ARVs, and 95% of those patients to have viral suppression. Zimbabwe also approved the use of an injectable long-acting pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP medication to protect against HIV, making it one of the few countries that have approved the use of this drug globally. For VOA, this is Kudzai Zunavashe from Harare.